on Business Incorporated today. The government of Egypt begins new expansion. Nigeria seeks credit from U.S. Ex Export Import Bank. And Ghana doubles IMF funding goal to $3 billion. Hello and welcome to Business Incorporated here on Channels Television. I'm Ini John Rekwa. Let's start as usual with market numbers. In Nigeria, the NGX has sustained that bearish sentiment. Uh, it's intraday, it was down 0.75%, barely maintaining the 50,000 basis level. JSC of South Africa was, however, on the flip side, it was up over 1% at 70,266 .13 point. Egypt sustained the positive momentum, however, but at lower pace, less than half a percentage. Kenya closed Monday straight positive, more than half a percent. We move to the Middle East now, where the market was mostly positive at intraday, except for Qatar. Abu Dhabi was trading 0.23% up. Dubai was better, more than 1%. Uh, Saudi Arabia was 0.14% in the green. The lone loser, Qatar index, shed 0.33% at intraday. Let's go to uh, Europe now. Could fracking help satisfy Germany's thirst for, nat for natural gas? Well, an industry group estimated that the controversial drilling method could supply about 10% of the country's gas needs. Seems it's unlikely to happen, but the debate shows the seriousness of the country's current energy crunch. Well, we have Stephen Bursley now joining us from Berlin to help us well, crack down on this fracking issue. Is fracking a possibility in Germany, given, of course, the tight circumstances, Stephen. Well, the short answer there is no, even if there is a bit more conversation about it these days. And that's because federal law still prohibits fracking across Germany. Now, that's a reflection of German mainstream opposition to the practice. In fact, fracking, uh, you often see the English word used here in press accounts. Uh, fracking is something of a dirty word, and that's because of the environmental problems associated with it. Now, that's been made easier in recent years because Germany has relied on uh, external deliveries of gas, that is Russian natural gas, very cheap natural gas. But now, now the, uh, the problems and the, and the terrible strings attached to that natural gas is also quite visible. In the near term, Germany is going to try and replace that Russian natural gas with other uh, deliveries, for example, liquefied natural gas to take care of heating, to take care of some industrial production. And then for electricity production, more likely other fossil fuels such as coal. There's also some industries that are um, playing around with other alternatives such as liquefied petroleum gas for their production methods. Now, in the mid and long term, we do see that Germany is willing to look at domestic production, uh, and that includes uh, natural gas reserves in the North Sea. When it comes to fracking, uh, there are several problems. One is, the biggest one is that opposition, but also it would probably take three to five years to really get supplies online. Mm -hmm. Gas, of course, will be needed in the long term, but given that opposition, given the hurdles that would need to be overcome now uh, to get it going, it's unlikely that the needle's really going to move on that anytime soon. Yeah, well, there's also the conversation about uh, extending the lifespan of German nuclear reactors. Uh, does it look like Berlin is, is giving this any serious thoughts? Right. And the fact that this is again in conversation shows just how serious this energy crisis is uh, from a political standpoint and just from what people are expecting this winter. Um, you know, we saw last week that uh, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz uh, has uh, sort of changed his position on the three remaining nuclear reactors that were due to go offline by the end of the year, uh, saying last week that it, quote, could make sense to extend their lifespan. Uh, that's quite a shift from months of saying that it wasn't a possibility. And he's been pulled uh, from in both directions directions by his coalition partners. On the one side, the more libertarian FDP party, uh, they've been encouraging uh, an extension of those nuclear reactors, and they wouldn't, mi they wouldn't mind seeing a, a general um, return to nuclear um, from the uh, German law that requires a withdrawal, that, that law passed during uh, Chancellor Merkel's era um, before the current government. Um, on the other side, the Greens, that's his other coalition partner. Now, intrinsically, they are anti-nuclear. That's embedded in the DNA of the party. And yet we've seen leaders recently suggest that they're 
open to extending the timeline on those reactors. It's important to note here that really when we're talking about nuclear in Germany right now, we really are talking about these three reactors. Uh, in a similar case to what we've seen with fracking, there is, uh, we have seen at least over the decades, an embedded mainstream opposition to nuclear as an energy source. And it's hard to see that changing in the near term because of what's going on right now. Um, so, you know, while we're talking about three reactors and while the outside conversation from um, other economists, from other energy experts looking at Germany may be about nuclear as a viable source for a transition to clean energy, really this conversation here internally, domestically, is really about these three reactors and the need, given the energy crunch that's expected this winter and also the winter after that. So, yes, there is uh, this kind of unthinkable discussion on nuclear in one sense, but on the in the broader sense, this really isn't a, a major shift in the policy here in Germany yet. All right, uh, Stephen, let's leave the energy scene for a bit and see what's happening with the markets. Well, markets started out a bit, uh, a bit uneven today, and they actually dipped a little bit. Really. All major European indexes and investors here are waiting on the inflation results from the U.S. tomorrow. That will dictate what happens um, there the, in, in Wall Street, of course, which would then have ripple effects uh, around the world. Uh, we are seeing more quarterly results. For example, Continental, uh, that is one of the major auto parts suppliers here in Germany, reporting some uh, some poor second quarter numbers. but reaffirming its yearly guidance, suggesting that uh, for that very critical auto parts market, that, that branch here in Germany, which has uh, hundreds of thousands of jobs tied to it in the auto industry at large, uh, that, that there is generally a positive outlook as the year continues and going into next year, especially as those chip shortages are solved and uh, they're able to pass along some of those price hikes uh, to customers. All right, Stephen, thank you so much for that update. Uh, we'll do it again tomorrow. Let's move to the UK now, where Juliana is standing by uh, to join us and give us an update from what's going on there. Hi, Juliana. Good afternoon. Well, uh, we hear talks about bus cuts being proposed by the Transport for London and, of course, uh, security concerns uh, emanating from that. Juliana, what's this about? Good afternoon, um, Inni. That's absolutely right. London Travel Watch have been sitting in these consultations uh, with TfL, and they're reporting that there are some serious security concerns if, indeed, uh, the body does decide to go ahead uh, with cutting approximately 72 routes of the 628 routes uh, that we have across London. Now, uh, many of our viewers who are watching from the capital today uh, will remember that TfL had to go uh, to the government, uh, cap in hand, and asking uh, for a series of bailouts. And that was because, of course, during the pandemic, up to 95% of passengers um, who were once flocking to use the London Underground just weren't uh, using it. Um, part of the ways they're funding is, of course, the ticketing system, and they couldn't afford it. Now, what TfL was saying is uh, when they were negotiating with the government, part of that negotiation uh, settlement was that uh, they would reduce the bus route service to bait back these funds. Um, so they have been consulting with a series of individuals to try and see where they can claw back some of these um, uh, uh, pennies. And um, according to them, the only way they can do this is to cut the bus service. And now many people uh, do use the bus. And according to the London Travel Watch, if indeed these services are cut, then it is going to affect uh, some minority uh, communities, women, um, those with disabilities and people of colour. And now this is because, of course, if uh, your bus service is regularly cut, you finish work at 8 p.m., you typically get one bus home. If that bus is no longer running, you'll have to go through a series of services. Um, so there, there has been a spat for quite a long time between uh, the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, and the Transport Secretary, Grant Shapps. And I think, you know, this is just uh, some uh, a banter between the two of them. We'll just have to wait and see whether or not uh, these services will be uh, cut as proposed. Yeah, well, uh, of course, we'll wait and see there and hope that it comes out better. But let's look at the markets now. How's it doing at intraday?
Yeah, it's uh, not great at intraday. There's been a, a, a couple of um, economic data news that's uh, spooked investors. One of them uh, was uh, the British Retail Consortium's data showing that retail sales in the three months to the end of uh, July have dipped. They dipped uh, by over 2%. I think there are no surprises there, really, uh, because we are going through the worst cost of living crisis in 40 years. I feel like I've been saying that every day uh, for the past three months, Inny, but it is true. And um, I think the squeeze is really starting to be reflected in the economic data. We also had separate data uh, from Barclay Card who regularly checks spending habits on credit and debit card purchases. And it is starting to show that households are shopping more frequently, uh, but they're doing, um, they're spending less at the checkout. So they're only buying uh, the essentials. So I think it goes to show that that gloomy update we had from the Bank of England last week about uh, Britain going into a five quarter technical recession is clearly on way. And I think that's reflected in the markets at intraday. The all share is down 0.03 percent. The FTSE 100 up though slightly by 0.04 percent. The FTSE 250 down by almost half of a percentage point. In the currencies the British pound is faring much better. Um, it's trading higher against the US dollar by 0.19 percent though down on the euro by 0.07 percent uh, but up on the Japanese yen by 0.10 percent at intraday. &E. Thank you so much Juliana. We'll certainly follow the market and other uh, current issues. So let's uh, leave the UK now and go to Asia shares in the Asia Pacific were mixed to stay on quiet data day as markets continue to digest last week's stellar US jobs report. SoftBank Group stocks fell around 7% after its vision fund reported a 2.93 trillion Japanese yen a loss for the June quarter on Monday after the market closed. The tech focus fund has suffered as central banks raise interest rate to fight inflation. The Nikkei 225 in Japan fell 0.88% to close at 27,999 and the topics index was down 0.74% to 1,937. 0.02. South Korea's cost fee closed about 0.42% higher at 2,503.46, while the cast that gained 0.34% to 833.65. In Australia, the S&P X200 rose 0.13% to 7,029.8. Hong Kong's Hang Seng Index gave up earlier gains to trade at 0.3% lower in the final hour of, search of trading, while the heavyweight Alibaba climbed 0.7%. Mainland China markets advanced. The Shanghai Composite gained 0.32% and the Shenzhen Components added 0.25%. And uh, going to the United States, now S&P futures fell uh, today after another chip maker warned about tough times ahead following Nvidia's poor forecast in the prior session. Losses were contained as investors awaited inflation data this week that will deter the pace of futures rates. I uh, to see the figures there. The Dow Jones was up 0.05%, S&P 500 was down 0.11% and the Nasdaq was down almost half uh, percent uh, that's for there. And then during Monday's regular trading, the S&P 500 slipped 0.12 percent and the Nasdaq composite ticked down 0.1 percent. Stocks had opened the session higher but then gave up most of those gains before the closing bell. Outside of chips, a pair of Nasdaq listed stocks were also taking early hits with S&P 500 coming off its third consecutive positive week. Investors are wondering if this comeback is just a bear market bounce, uh, the start of a new sustained advance. Let's go to oil prices now. It dipped in early trading on the latest progress in last ditch talks to revive the 2015 Iran nuclear accord, which would clear the way to boost its crude exports in a tight market. Renko futures fell 27 cents to $96.38 a barrel, pairing 1.8% gain from the previous session. U.S. West Texas intermediate crude futures declined 24 cents to $90.52 a barrel after it climbed two percent in the previous session. However, signs that demand may not be dented as much as Fed are keeping a floor under the market for now, following stronger than expected trade data from China on the weekend and surprising acceleration in U.S. jobs growth in July. Traders will be watching out for weekly U.S. oil inventory data, first from American Petroleum Institute uh, today and then Energy Information Administration tomorrow.
And uh, related to that, now the Ministry of Petroleum and Mineral Resources has started the expansion of the Hamra Petroleum Port in El Ahim region, which is represented in a 120 feathered plots of land on the coastal area. The new expansion of the port aims to increase the storage capacity by adding four storage tanks with a capacity of 630,000 barrels of crude each to reach a storage capacity of 5.3 million barrels. The shipment of about 700,000 barrels of Russian oil was delivered to Hamra port early in July, and that's according to ship tracking data by Bloomberg. This unusual move has made tracking the final destination of shipments difficult, making the direction of Russian oil shipments increasingly opaque since European buyers began avoiding them after the country invaded Ukraine. An EU ban on oil shipments from Moscow and on the provision of insurance and other shipping services is set to take effect at the end of this year, and that should increase pressure on Russia to identify and and test different ways to get a shipment to buyers. We'll take a break now. When we come back from that break, we have more stories from the African continent. Do stay with us. This is Business Incorporated on Channel Television. Welcome back. You're still watching Business Incorporated here on Channel Television. We're talking cobalt now in our commodity space. It's a solid mineral utilized as a raw material in the manufacture of batteries for electric vehicle and electronics. The price of cobalt has recently declined by 7.14% globally to 53,484.15 per ton. And that's because of the slowdown in automotive sales, among other challenges, such as supply chain disruption. Uh, we have joining us in the studio now from the financial derivatives company, uh, Victoria Momo, joining us. Hi, Victoria. Good afternoon. Hi. Good afternoon. So I think it's good at least to have something uh, you know, price going down in the midst of all the inflation, even though not for very good reasons, because we know eventually this is going to affect economic outputs, uh, GDP growth, and, and all of that. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> all right, so uh, at, happening at this time, what impact does it have? Um, okay, so it is true that um, the price of um, cobalt is um, declining, and um, despite um, the um, rally in um, global commodity prices, and um, um, the um, demand for cobalt is a derived demand, and um, this means that um, if there is an increase in, in um, the demand for electronics and um, electronic vehicle, it means that the demand for cobalt would rise in tandem. Um, so. Um, there are issues, um, okay, before, um, early this year, um, we witnessed a spillover of um, excess demand um, due to the lockdown imposed in um, 2020 and 2021, uh, which caused um, manufacturers, automobile manufacturers, to um, cut down in production of um, um, new vehicles. Um, as a result of that, um, the demand for cobalt um, declined as um, cobalt is an essential mineral that is used to manufacture batteries that um, powers um, electronics and um, um, electric vehicle. And um, in addition to that, um, the slowdown in um, um, China economy, uh, which was um, largely due to um, the COVID-19 um, imposed um, lockdown, induced lockdown, also um, caused um, the demand for cobalt to um, decline and subsequently the, cry, um, the price of um, cobalt to, to decline. And um, China is um, the top um, consumer of cobalt and um, accounting and its um, um, rechargeable battery industry accounts for 60% um, of um, world um, global um, consumption. And, um, the impact of this um, declining price will be deeply felt by um, the Democratic um, Republic of Congo, uh, which is um, the top um, producer of um, um, cobalt. And um, it accounts for 70% um, of um, the world um, supply of um, cobalt and holds um, uh, more than 50% of um, the um, world um, um, cobalt reserves. Do, do we see a recovery of the demand uh, anytime soon? Yes. Yeah, so I mean, the war is still on in, in, in Russia, I mean, in Ukraine. Um, the threat of COVID is not over yet. And the Asian countries are determined to have zero cases. So that means there can be a lockdown at any point in time. Um, yes. 
uh, we see a recovery in demand soon, um, and the price of um, um, cobalt is expected to increase, you know, despite um, this um, temporal decrease in um, cobalt prices. And um, this is um, um, due to um, the projected increase in um, demand for cobalt due to, or as nations um, uh, shift towards um, um, clean energy. Um, electronic vehicles um, have um, increased um, between um, 2012 and 2021 um, from um, 120,000 to um, about 6.6 6 million. And, um, we could also see that um, the um, phase of um, global monetary policy tightening is expected um, to, uh, to taper inflationary pressures. And when this happens, um, consumer spending increases, and with that, the demand for electronics and um, mm. vehicles increases. All right, uh, Victoria, thank you so much for that. Uh, I'll certainly, maybe look for more electric vehicles in Nigeria. <laughs> that will add to the demand and bring back the price of cobalt. Thank you so much, Victoria Momo, for uh, sharing this time with us. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you All very right. much. So moving on to other stories now. Uh, in Nigeria, the authorities will seek credit from the U.S. Export-Import Bank to fund a solar power project being developed by Sun Africa LLC, a renewable energy provider. The unit of Urban Green Technologies LLC is developing solar power facilities for Nigeria's Niger Delta Power Holding Company. The projects, which have passed through feasibility studies, technical analysis, and land permitting phases in the past two years, are due for loan processing with the Export Credit Agency. Nigerian Finance Ministry is expected within the next 60 days to send final commitment application to Exim for the facility, after which the lender will conduct due diligence on the project before the loan is finalized. This is all in the bid to integrate solar into the energy mix of the country to boost supply as poor maintenance and insufficient investment in the transmission network have resulted in only about a third of the country's installed capacity being dispatched by the grid daily. Well, still staying in Nigeria, the Nigerian Upstream Petroleum Regulatory Commission has affirmed that status quo remains in respect of uh, ExxonMobil and Seplat Energy Share Acquisition. The Chief Executive Officer of the Commission, Mr. Agbega Komolafe, who signed the press release, insists that the Commission, in line with the provisions of the Petroleum Industry Act 2021, is the sole regulator in dealing with such matters. This release comes after the Nigerian President, Mohamed Buhari, who also serves as the Minister Minister of Petroleum approved Seplat Energy PLC's $1.28 billion purchase of ExxonMobil Corp's shallow water business in the West African country, seemingly putting an end to efforts by the national oil company to block the deal. The decision of the president should clear the way for Seplat to complete an agreement announced in February to acquire four permits from Exxon. However, with the stance of the Nigerian Upstream Petroleum Regulatory Commission, more clarity is obviously required. Yeah, moving from Nigeria now, we go to Ghana, where the government there is in talks with a loan over a loan of about $3 billion from the International Monetary Fund, that's the IMF. The amount is double what the West African nation was considering a month ago as it tries to shore up its finances and win back access to global markets. The funding will be provided over three years. The extended credit facility for low-income countries is the fund's main tool for medium-term support for countries facing protracted balance of payment problems. Similar to Ghana's, the duration of such an arrangement is between three to four years and extendable to five years. The final program is ultimately decided by the IMF Executive Board, and the government began discussions with the Washington-based multilateral lender last month. That's it on the program for today. Thank you so much for being a part of the Tuesday edition of Business Incorporated. We have Wednesdays coming in 24 hours. I'm Lee